Five years ago, my fiancé died in the line of duty and his body was never found. But on the night of August 20 this year at 8.17 p.m., Captain Smith called me personally and said, Thomas has been found. He's not dead, he's alive and well, but he's getting married. Chapter 1 As we headed to the coastal town, Captain Smith and the police officers accompanying me kept trying to convince me, but I couldn't give up hope. I pursued him for two years, pampered him for five, and begged for marriage twice. How could he forget me? I fiddled with the engagement ring on my finger. He had already proposed to me, how could he marry someone else? From plane to bus, I felt sick during the five-hour bus ride, and after ten hours, the four of us finally arrived at the town. There it is. Captain Smith pointed to a guesthouse called Sunny Days. This previously unknown and suddenly gained popularity because of a set of photos taken by tourists, and the appearance of the owner in those photos made him a fan favorite, despite only showing a profile. It was enough to drive people crazy. Captain Smith glanced at me, he doesn't remember anything, we must. I stared intently at that door, feeling numb. When Captain Smith pushed open the door, a special conch shell wind chime rang out a clear sound. In front of me was a large courtyard, with a cobblestone path leading to the house. In the yard, there was a huge swing, a golden retriever, and many cats. I looked at these animals in surprise. Suddenly, a person walked out from behind the shell curtain. The man was tall with long legs, his muscular arms visible under a black t-shirt. His profile was clean and sharp. The moment I saw him, my body involuntarily froze in place. My back tingled, my head buzzed, and it felt like all bodily functions suddenly shut down. I could only muster all my strength to stare fixedly at the man in front of me. I had seen someone who looked 80% like Thomas before, even the teardrop mole under the corner of his eye was identical, but with one look, I knew he wasn't Thomas. The man in front of me was far from the boyish Thomas the first knew. His face was more mature, with sharper angles and a colder demeanor. I couldn't help but move closer and closer until I saw the teardrop mole at the corner of his eye, the red string around his neck. Thomas. I choked back tears, softly calling out his name, afraid of scaring him away. He looked up at me with an extremely unfamiliar gaze. What? Thomas. I could hardly say his name. The man looked at me coldly, I'm sorry, miss, you've mistaken me for someone else. In this lifetime, I could mistake anything, but I would never mistake Thomas, because he was half of my life. Captain Smith quickly pulled me away. I'm sorry, do you have any vacant rooms? Thomas, with his arms crossed, carefully examined us. Yes, how many rooms do you need? Two. Come in. He turned around and walked into the house without even glancing at us. I naively thought that as long as he saw me, he would remember me, as long as he saw me. Everything would be different. But his gaze towards me was unfamiliar, sharp, and even a bit disdainful. I didn't cry when I heard he was still alive, I didn't cry when I heard he was getting married, but just thinking about his eyes moments ago, my heart felt like it was being squeezed in someone's hand, on the verge of bursting, tears falling uncontrollably. Chapter 2 Identification Captain Smith handed us our IDs. As the man took the ID, I clearly saw that his left pinky was missing a piece. He walked towards the counter, slightly limping on his right leg, and I covered my mouth. Captain Smith quickly took the room keycard and had someone escort me out. I sat in the room for a long time before finding my voice. How did he end up like this? On the way here, I swore that when I saw him, I would slap him hard, this unfaithful man, how could he forget me and marry another woman? But when I saw him, I suddenly couldn't bear it, I just wanted to hug him. I stayed in the room for a long time, so long that Denise was afraid I would get into trouble and forcefully took me out of the room. Everyone was having a barbecue in the backyard, and I immediately saw Thomas skewering food, Captain Smith standing next to him, the two of them seemed to get along well. Monica, feeling better now? I nodded. Tom, let me introduce you, this is Monica. I slowly reached out my hand, trying to control myself from trembling, hello. His warm and generous hand briefly shook mine, hello. 
the greeting between strangers, at that moment, my nose tingled, remembering the time he proposed, holding me so gently that it was unbelievable, calling me, honey, hello. It was all missed. Looking at the person in front of me, I had countless questions to ask, but in the end, I only asked. It's beautiful here, are you all doing well here? He skillfully flipped the barbecue grill and casually replied, pretty good. That's good. As we talked, a piece of chicken suddenly fell down, and he looked towards the door, Potato, come here. Potato is the name of the orange cat we adopted together, a name he came up with, saying. Fat and round, might as well be called Potato. Watching the big golden retriever wagging its tail over, my throat tightened. He's called Potato? Yeah, fat and round, what else would you call it? I turned away quietly wiping away tears, only he could come up with such a cheesy name. After the skewers were done, everyone gathered around to eat. I grabbed a beer from the table and poured it into my mouth, the bitter taste spreading, looking at the person across from me, the beauty mark I often made fun of was still at the corner of his eye, a red string still hanging around his neck, just not sure if it was the one I gave him. Everything felt unreal. Denise handed out skewers, putting mushrooms on his plate. I grabbed them first, no, he can't eat mushrooms. Everyone at the table suddenly looked at me. Just as I was at a loss, a figure suddenly ran over, jumped directly on Thomas's back, and affectionately rubbed against him. Tom, I missed you so much. Thomas quickly bent over, one hand protecting the person behind him, get down. Although it sounded like a reprimand, I could only hear indulgence in his tone. The person on his back was pulled into his arms, and he introduced with a smile. This is my wife, Nina. Chapter 3 I was still holding that string of mushrooms, staring blankly at the smiling girl in front of me, whose smile was as bright as the sun, my heart trembled, as if I had been struck by a heavy hammer, unable to catch my breath. Hello, I am Nina, Tom's wife. Welcome to Haicheng. Captain Smith and his team greeted one by one. Nina was very talkative, she praised everyone, including me. Monica, you are so beautiful. So slim, I envy you. Your hair is so nice, unlike mine, I'm going bald soon. Then she turned to look at the man behind her. It must be your fault for my hair problems, be more careful, or else I'll be a bald bride at the wedding next week. Thomas rubbed her hair and smiled helplessly, okay. Looking into her clear eyes, not a speck of dust ever fell, filled with anticipation for the wedding, just like I used to be. A wedding? Denise asked. Yes. Our wedding is next Wednesday, I hope you all can attend. I opened another beer, and Nina grabbed one too, but as soon as she got it, the man took it from her, no drinking. Nina pouted, just a sip. Ignoring our presence, she secretly kissed him, come on, Tom, just one sip, please. Here, have this. Inside the white cup were swirling roses, as the cup opened, the scent of roses wafted out. Nina frowned, roses? Tom. I've told you a hundred times, I don't like floral tea. How do you keep forgetting every time? I don't know. I just end up making it each time. Hearing his words, I turned away and finished the last sip of beer. I don't like drinking water. In high school, I strained my throat from reciting, sometimes unable to speak. To make me drink more water, Thomas tried various types, floral tea, fruit tea, oolong tea, rotating them. In winter, he even made me apple water and pear soup. Every time I drank an extra cup of water, Thomas, who was so doting, almost worshipped my pink thermos. Seeing me finish the beer, Nina continued. Look, Monica has already finished a can, maybe her hair is so good because she drinks beer. Big mouth. Looking at the beer next to me, I smiled bitterly. My ex-boyfriend also didn't let me drink because I'm a lightweight, he was very strict with me. Nina looked at me. So, he won't be angry now that you're drinking? I glanced behind her and shook my head. He doesn't care about me anymore. Seemingly having said the wrong thing, Nina looked apologetically at me, didn't say more, and obediently drank from Thomas's cup. I only ate that skewer of mushrooms, drank quite a bit of alcohol, felt a bit dizzy, and left early. 
As I was stepping down the stairs, I heard Nina's cheerful laughter. I turned back to see Nina clinging to Thomas's back like a sloth, gesticulating and talking non-stop. Thomas occasionally stumbled but continued good-naturedly tidying up the table, as if he was used to it. Thomas isn't an easygoing person, I thought he was only kind to me, I thought he would only love me in this lifetime. Watching Nina's face about to overflow with happiness, I covered my aching heart, feeling so sad that I could almost die. That should have been me. I should have been the one pampered by Thomas beyond measure. I resisted the urge to intervene in their excitement, forced myself to return to the room, opened my bag, emptied everything on the floor, and only after swallowing the pills did my emotional tide slowly begin to ebb. When Denise came in, I had already returned to normal. I thought you were going to make a scene. I looked out the window, I did plan to, but suddenly I couldn't bring myself to do it. I see you brought so many things. Are you trying to help Thomas regain his memory? That box contains our 10 years, his first little note to me, the first love letter, gifts from my 18th to 28th birthdays, our first photo together, and our first wedding photo. I shook my head, never thought of it. Denise looked at me in surprise, why? Thinking of Thomas's parents' tragic death, I closed my eyes, steadying my emotions. The pain of losing loved ones, I don't want him to endure it twice. Chapter 4 The next day, I woke up very late. By the time I finished packing my sketchpad and went out, it was already past lunchtime. Denise waved at me, Monica, I saved you some food. Everyone chatted around the wooden table in the yard. When Nina saw me, she hurried back into the house and returned with an orange envelope in her hand, offering it to me like a treasure. Monica, we don't have many relatives, so I formally invite you to our wedding. It was a formal invitation. I took the envelope but didn't have the courage to take out the invitation inside. Nina kept urging me, Monica, you study art, could you take a look at this invitation design for us? A thin piece of paper felt like a thousand pounds to me. Come, let me see. This color is so beautiful, Denise quickly spoke up. I think so too. This orange was Tom's choice. I picked purple, but the orange looks better. Monica, what color do you like? I set down my sketch pad and pointed to my orange outfit. Before high school, I didn't have a favorite color until one day when I wore an orange jacket, Thomas said I looked great in orange. Since then, orange became my favorite color. Monica, your taste seems to match Tom's. Tom from my house. Listening to those four words felt particularly harsh. There was a time when Thomas loved to call me my Monica in public. Denise saw my expression and immediately took the invitation from my hand. The cartoon inside looks like you, very cute. But it's in the evening? The wedding is in the evening? Rubbing her face, Nina said, that's Tom's request. Because he said. Because someone can't get up. Nina stared at me blankly. Monica. How did you know? Tom said that. But most importantly, Tom especially likes evenings. Thomas once said that his favorite time of the day was evening because that's when Sleeping Beauty turned into his girlfriend. I was naturally a night owl, waking up at 5.30 a.m. M. In high school was torture for me. During those three years, every morning, I would sit behind Thomas on his bike, close my eyes, and continue sleeping, dreaming three times in the ten-minute break, waking up each time with his school uniform draped over me. I remember one time, half asleep, someone sighed beside me. Ah. You sleep so well. What will happen on the day I marry you? It wasn't until my 24th birthday when his stubble woke me up. I pushed him away to continue sleeping, he pulled me into his arms, gently patting my back, hoarse as he said. Monica, let's have our wedding in the evening. I grunted twice, he kissed my forehead, satisfied, and let out a sigh. I have to let my little sleepyhead sleep enough, or else if you get cranky and don't marry me, who will I reason with? And now, it's not that I won't marry, but he's marrying someone other than me, truly leaving me with no one to reason with. I picked up the drawing board and at that moment, Nina saw the ring on my ring finger. I shook the ring at her gaze and said. Because he said so too. Are you married, Monica? 
Yes, I've been married for five years. Nina was surprised. Where's your husband? Didn't he come with you? I looked at the man approaching in the distance and shook my head slightly. Chapter 5 As we walked out of the guesthouse gate, Nina's laughter followed. She was telling Denise about Tom's proposal process, and I quickened my pace as if there were ghosts chasing me. I found a vacant spot, set up the drawing board, just as I picked up the palette, my head spun for a moment. I took out the pill box from my pocket, swallowed a pill, and the discomfort slowly dissipated. I've never been a lucky person. I have no parents, no friends, no second chances. I thought the goddess of luck hated me, but then that day came. I won a doll I had liked for a long time, got a free milk tea, cracked a golden egg at the supermarket for a 5,000 yuan cash prize, even the cola I bought for Ruth was a second bottle. Ruth looked at me with a smile, goddess of luck, thanks to you. I couldn't believe it. How could someone like me, who had always been unlucky, have such good luck? Just as our car turned a corner, the car suddenly lost control and crashed forward. As the wall in front got closer and closer, I screamed in fear. Bang. The car crashed through the wall, but surprisingly, the impact was almost zero. Through the gap in my fingers, I faintly saw an orange light spreading, drifting with a floral scent, landing on the man in the middle of the suit. Thomas stood in the sea of flowers, dressed in a well-tailored suit, with friends and family all dressed up, even Potato was in a handsome little suit squatting beside him. I looked in astonishment at everything in front of me until Thomas walked over and opened the door. I still remembered the first thing he said to me, Monica, it's time. This was our secret code, time to eat, time to go home, time to kiss, time for you to marry me. He lifted me out of the car, applause ringing in my ears constantly. Thomas, someone who had been through life and death situations for many years, was surprisingly nervous and stumbled over his words. Monica, did you have a good day today? I choked up and couldn't speak, only nodding vigorously. He smiled mischievously, Monica, there's something very, very important that I need you to do for me, and only you can do it. I looked at him, what? Marry me. Marry me, and I'll make you this lucky, every day. And, I'll throw in a buy one, get two free deal. Maybe even get three free. It was strange, so many things with Thomas happened naturally, without needing any setup or assumptions. It was like I knew he would marry me, and he knew I wouldn't marry anyone but him. After the proposal that day, on the way back, he bought a lottery ticket. He said to me, if we win, the 30 million is all yours. What if we don't win? I asked him. He looked calm, it means marrying you has used up all my luck. I laughed uncontrollably, then said seriously. I always thought I had bad luck but it turns out all that bad luck was just so I could meet you. Well, of course. You saved up 18 years of luck just to meet me. I hope you cherish me. I leaned over and kissed him, saying solemnly, I will. As the sunset appeared, I greedily watched that fiery red, the words echoing in my ears, but only the old friend was absent. Returning with my sketchpad, lights were already on outside the guest house. Approaching, I saw a figure standing at the door, red sparks floating in the air, the smell of nicotine wafting over. I frowned at the person before me. When he turned his head at the sound, I saw a hint of panic in his eyes. He quickly extinguished his cigarette, awkwardly scratching the back of his head, resembling Thomas every time he was caught smoking. I stood still, trying hard to ignore him, but as we passed each other, I heard him say, Monica, I remember you. Chapter 6. Boom. I felt all the blood in my body rush to my head. Was my Thomas back? Stiffening, I turned around, shoulders and calves trembling involuntarily. My heart trembled too. The name Thomas was on the tip of my tongue, but I stopped myself when I met his indifferent gaze. Thomas never looked at me like this. When he looked at me, there was always a smile, his eyes full of tenderness enveloping me. The sudden mix of sorrow and joy made my heart ache. I lowered my head, hiding the redness in my eyes from him. Captain Smith told me, but he didn't mention you, he analyzed slowly. I feel like I know you, but not in a colleague way. 
Every time I see you, I feel a sense of guilt, even a bit of fear. You know I'm allergic to mushrooms, and the red string around your neck is the same as mine. The red string we both got from the Xian Yan Temple. I prayed for his safety, he prayed for his wishes to be fulfilled. The red string had two silver pendants with our initials. I forgot, Thomas was a scout by profession. Even without his memories, his inherent alertness remained. Captain Smith and the others' overly warm attitudes couldn't escape his eyes. He could figure things out in a day or two, but my identity. He couldn't quite pinpoint it, or maybe he didn't want to believe it. I slowly lifted my head to meet his scrutinizing gaze, but he looked down at my ring. Nina said you got married, you. I. Although his hands were in his pockets, I knew he must be clenching his fists now, his heart a mess. Yes. The man who had found his happiness was suddenly faced with a woman who might be related to him. His mind must be in turmoil. I struggled to speak, my throat dry. After several attempts, I finally managed to say. I am indeed married, but. It has nothing to do with you. I could visibly see him breathe a sigh of relief. That moment was the most painful moment of my life. I couldn't believe that there would come a day when Thomas would be relieved that he had no connection with me. I still remember high school, the redness of his ears and his bewildered expression when caught peeking at me, as well as his ecstatic expression when I agreed to be his girlfriend, as if he had won the world, a smile of fulfillment that I had only seen twice. What about him? I looked at the person in front of me, tears uncontrollably rolling down. He looked at me apologetically, I'm sorry, I. I bent down, raising my hand to stop all his movements. Your parents pitted me, raised me as their daughter. I have little to do with you. I'm here mainly to take a look for the elderly couple, as for the red string. I gave it a hard tug, letting the red string fall. Your parents prayed for your safety and incidentally prayed for me too. Thomas looked at me in silence, but I had no more strength to continue the act. These words should put his mind at ease regarding the marriage. I don't know how I made it back to the room. I thought I had it all under control, but as I turned around, tears gushed out uncontrollably. My makeup was ruined by tears, revealing a tired and weak face. I covered my face, crouching in the corner of the bathroom, crying for a long time. Five years. I dreamed of Thomas returning to me, but when he appeared, I had to push him away. Why treat me like this? Why me? Due to intense emotions, my stomach churned, a taste of blood in my throat. Monica, what's wrong? Open the door. I leaned against the wall, stood up, pressed the flush button as usual, quickly touched up my makeup that had been ruined by tears, and then walked out as if nothing had happened. I'm fine, just tripped accidentally. The compassionate look in Denise's eyes made me feel uneasy. You don't have to hold back in front of me. I turned away, I'm fine. Denise looked at me, hesitated, then patted me and went back to bed. As she turned her head, I saw something on the table again, an orange invitation card, an evening wedding that should have been mine. At that moment, I suddenly felt very frustrated and upset. Emotions took over, and I rushed out, heading straight to the lobby. I had to tell him, I am your fiancé. Chapter 7 the salty sea breeze blew, stinging my face. Nina's laughter came from the second floor. I looked up and saw Thomas blow-drying Nina's hair. The careful yet loving gesture was so familiar. Nina lay comfortably in his arms, and I, the former one in his arms, became a bystander. I was frozen in place by that laughter. If, if I told him I was his fiancé, Thomas was a responsible man. How would he handle me? I didn't want his pity, I just wanted Thomas to love me. By the time I calmed down, it was already dawn, but Denise was still awake. He found out by himself, although he lost his memory, he didn't forget his profession. I know. Thomas was always smart, how could he not see that Captain Smith was intentionally or unintentionally getting close? What about his parents? Did Captain Smith tell him? The air fell silent for a few seconds, they said it was a car accident. I nodded, not saying anything more. 
at least this reason was somewhat acceptable. After the wedding, Thomas said he would come back to Lynn City with us. After a long pause, I spoke, he has started a family, he should take his wife to see his parents. It's the right thing to do. Did Thomas ask you? I remembered the person waiting at the door. He did, I didn't say anything, don't worry. Monica, you know that's not what we meant. I held my stomach, feeling the pain, but that's what I meant. From 18 to 28, a whole decade. Thomas had become a part of my life, entwined like a vine in my most important memories. Now, stripped away, it was a blurred mess, unbearably painful. On the third day here, insomnia found me again. I lay awake until dawn, still two days away from their wedding. Nina's voice echoed in the yard early in the morning as she busied herself with wedding preparations. Here, I want a floral arch with red roses. How long should the red carpet be? How big should the backdrop be? Tom, if there's no photo wall, you're in big trouble. The voices in the yard continued incessantly. I buried my head under the covers, but Nina's voice kept piercing my ears. In fact, we had our own wedding. The flower path was lined with white jasmine from his proposal, the bouquet was handmade by Thomas, with small orange orchids exuding a sweet fragrance. The guest seats were adorned with orange ribbons, and even the menu took us four revisions to finalize. Even the wedding favors were chosen together, with our cartoon versions printed on the boxes. He held my hand as we walked down the long flower path. His warm hand trembled unexpectedly, even though it was just a rehearsal, he was extremely nervous. Everything went smoothly, but the task was supposed to be completed that night. He hadn't managed to put the wedding ring on me, nor had he seen me in the wedding dress embroidered with his name. He kept apologizing, promising to be back in a week to marry me. I waited and waited, five years went by, only to hear news of him marrying someone else. As I finished getting ready and stepped outside, many people were setting up the venue in the yard. Nina immediately ran over when she saw me. Monica, I need a little favor from you. I couldn't have imagined that the favor Nina needed was for her wedding. Chapter 8 On the white backdrop, I skillfully took out my palette, selected the colors I needed, and with a few strokes, I outlined a sunset. All right, Monica, you did a great job. If we didn't have to put up the photos, I'd let you finish the whole thing. I put away my paintbrush. Photos? Nina turned around. It's photos of Tom and me over these five years. Nina pasted one photo after another, a familiar girl, or perhaps she just wanted to share her happiness with everyone, as she kept talking about their five years together. This one is when Tom just got out of the hospital, looking terribly thin yet particularly fierce. I saved him, he worked for me to repay the debt. Actually, I was the first one who fell for him. I chased him for two years, and his reasons for rejecting me were always the same. Nina scratched her head. He said he forgot something very, very important, and until he found it, he didn't want anything else. I suddenly remembered what he said when he proposed, Monica, there's something very, very important that I need you to do, and only you can do it. What? Be my wife. I looked at the person in the photo, my voice hoarse. Did you find that very, very important thing? Nina shook her head. No, he doesn't remember anything. I aimlessly searched with him for three years. Later, we went through some tough times together, and he pitied that I was an old maid, so he settled for me. After a long silence, I heard my own voice, it seems it's still not important. Nina immediately retorted, no, it's very important to Tom. He particularly hates hospitals, but for that matter, he went through three years of treatment without fail. In the photo in front of me, Thomas stood by the sea, sunlight bathing him, laughing wildly and freely. I saw the 18-year-old Thomas, carefree and arrogant, but bowing to the girl. I raised my hand and touched the photo. Why bother? Forgetting means it's not important. Monica, sign the first name. The orange pen in my hand felt heavy, and I held it without moving for a long time, forget it, my handwriting isn't very good. Fresh flowers for the wedding need to be pre-ordered. Thomas was busy preparing for Nina's wedding. 
Nina urged me to go out with her. I wanted to refuse, but I also wanted to hear what she had to say after these five years. The flower shop was in town, not very big, but filled with many flowers. Boss, a thousand red roses, to be delivered the day after tomorrow. It seemed like an acquaintance. The boss gestured okay, just got some small blue orchids, very fresh, want a few? Nina shook her head, I like flowers with strong fragrance and vibrant colors, that's not my type of flower. The girl in front of me was like a red rose, passionate and full of vitality, capable of healing everything, including wounded souls. As we left the flower shop, I still bought two small blue orchids. The orange petals emitted a faint fragrance. There was a fruit stall on the roadside. Nina squatted to pick rambutans, Tom loves rambutans the most, buy more for him. We live in a northern city where common fruits are apples and pears. I didn't know his favorite was actually the southern rambutan. Except for his face, it seemed like nothing else was my Thomas anymore. The roar of a motorcycle in the distance could be heard. The swaying motorcycle swiftly fled down the narrow alley, followed by two policemen. The motorcycle quickly approached, but the rider showed no intention of stopping. Just as Nina was about to stand up, the motorcycle grazed her clothes. I used all my strength to push her away. The painful impact instantly hit me. I was pushed onto the fruit stall, with fruits falling to the ground. At that moment, I only saw my flowers being trampled underfoot. Monica. Chapter 9. On the third day here, I was admitted to the hospital. When I woke up in the evening, there was a group of people by my bedside, including Captain Smith and Thomas. I was too weak to speak. Nina said a lot, tears in her eyes. I saw someone comforting her, and then closing their eyes. When I woke up in the early morning, the room was dark. My first instinct was to touch my hair. Someone in the darkness took my hand, tidied my hair for me, and their hand suddenly felt warm. The person on the bed sobbed. When did this happen? I looked at the figure in front of me and sighed, about half a year ago. Why didn't you say anything? I patted her arm, it's not a bad thing. This illness is a relief for me. I'm sorry, really sorry. I didn't know you were sick. I was wary of you getting close to Thomas. I patted Denise's hand, you're not wrong. I did have impure intentions. It's Thomas after all. I loved the man I almost married for ten years. No matter what, I had to fight for myself. The stomach pain returned. I held my breath for a moment. When the pain subsided a bit, I spoke. If not for this illness, I would have caused a scene. Otherwise, I wouldn't be at peace. Denise's soft crying made me uncomfortable. Really not going to tell him? There's still a chance, Monica. Denise's sudden change of heart caught me off guard. I tried to keep my eyes open, to prevent tears from falling. Even if I was unwilling, I could only accept my fate. No. We all know that Thomas's parents' deaths were not accidental, they were revenge. If he found out the truth, how much pain would he be in? And knowing his character, he wouldn't just let it go. He might risk his life. I don't want him to be hurt again. I sniffed, I can't just tell him I'm his fiancé and have him deal with my funeral immediately. Losing three family members in one go, how will he cope? He's about to. Get married. Denise, who was crying more and more next to me, I held her hand and comforted her. Don't cry for me. When I found out about this illness, I felt relieved. All the torment was finally going to end. But when I heard about Thomas, I felt shattered. Yet, seeing him with Nina, I suddenly felt grateful for having this illness. Monica. I turned away, tears sliding into the pillow. And you saw it too, he's Tom, not my Thomas. Thomas must still be waiting for me to find him. Denise, I can see him soon. Denise gently embraced me, and I hugged her back. Denise, can you do me a favor? That night, Denise couldn't sleep because of crying, while I, having revealed my secret, slept without any burden. On the fourth morning, I woke up early. Denise helped me with my wig, and I applied some makeup. 
She asked, are you still putting on makeup? Since coming here, I've been putting on makeup every day because my complexion was so poor, and I wanted to look a bit more dignified. Just a simple touch to look a bit lively. Denise didn't speak, but her touch became lighter. When Nina came to bring breakfast, I noticed something was off about her. She seemed lifeless and dazed. Finally, when Denise left the room, she approached me. Sister Monica, Tom is your husband, right? Chapter 10 I shook the bowl of porridge in my hand, about to speak when she said, I didn't mean to rummage through your things. I was just getting your clothes for laundry. I set down the porridge, looking at the girl in front of me who suddenly started crying. I took him from you. He was supposed to be yours. I dominated him for five years. I'm really sorry, Sister Monica. I'm really sorry. The kind girl in front of me cried uncontrollably. Nina, you haven't wronged me. Tom is your lover, and Thomas is mine. You haven't taken anything from me. But Tom is Thomas. I shook my head, wiping away her tears. No, Tom loves you, and Thomas loves me. If I say he's not him, then he's not. I risked my life to save you, not to see you get divorced. Nina stayed until Denise returned before leaving. Her eyes were still red when she left. Denise went back to rest in the afternoon and brought dinner in the evening. I never expected Thomas to bring dinner that night. When I saw him come in, I was glad I had put on makeup, but I was worried my headscarf might be crooked. I took the opportunity while he turned away to fix it multiple times. In the thermos were easily digestible egg custard, milk buns, braised ribs, and to my surprise, dessert, sweet potato cheese. I really wanted to taste the braised ribs he made, wondering if he put in too much soy sauce this time. But my stomach could only handle a little bit of egg custard. I sat on the bed, and Thomas stood by the window. We didn't exchange a word, but it didn't feel awkward at all. There was a time when we would wake up from an afternoon nap in the evening. I would sit on the windowsill playing the guitar, and he would lie on the bed watching me. No words needed, just understanding between us. Today, my stomach was surprisingly cooperative. I finished the egg custard in the bowl, and as I reached for the sweet potato cheese, he walked over and handed it to me. Thank you, I said. No need to thank me. You saved Nina, I should thank you. The sweet sweet potato cheese now tasted bitter. After hastily eating a couple of bites, dinner ended. I knew he had something to say, but in the end, he only said four words, get well soon. I knew I should say something auspicious now, like wishing him a happy marriage, growing old together. But I couldn't say a single word. Thank you, I hope you. I had to muster some strength to continue, live well. Forgive me, this is the best blessing I can give. Thomas nodded, picked up the thermos, and left. My gaze followed his figure closely, and as he closed the door, I pulled out the four-drip, limping over to the window. His silhouette appeared in my view once again, and I greedily stared at his back, wanting to etch it into my mind, knowing this was the last time I would see him. On the fifth day since I arrived here, it was Thomas and Nina's wedding. I heard my seat was in the front row, but I'm sorry, I was already on the train. The train ticket was bought long ago, heading back to Linchang. Shortly after sitting down, my stomach started to ache. These days, the frequency of my stomach pains has been increasing. I know, the favor Denise asked for is about to come due. Since being with Thomas, I've become very delicate, getting upset over minor pains. Thomas's friends used to say he had a bad temper, but since we started dating, he became so patient, even when I was being unreasonable. I fell for it, every time he held me tightly, his deep voice next to my ear, calling me, baby, all the pain would vanish in that moment. But now, I was in pain, sweating and clutching my stomach, fingers turning white from the pressure. In the past, he would have been extremely worried, just like when we were in college and I got glass stuck in my hand, he would hold my head against his chest, comforting me endlessly. But now, the pain I felt was a hundred times worse than when the glass pierced my skin. I called out his name while leaning on the table. Thomas, why aren't you here to comfort me? As the train headed north, the painkillers took effect and I fell asleep. 
I dreamt of going back to high school, seeing the 18-year-old Thomas, with eyes only for me, that Thomas who loved only me. If there's a next life, I hope that in my youth, the first person I meet will still be Thomas. Thomas is extra. We returned to Linchang in the evening, first visiting my parents. Looking at the photos on the wall, I finally discovered who I inherited my features from. They were just as I imagined, a gentle and warm mother, a stern and serious father. After everyone left, I stayed alone with my parents, telling them everything from the past five years. When I came down from the mountain, the tears in the corners of my eyes had long dried, leaving only the smell of smoke all over me. But as I looked at everything becoming more familiar, my heart still felt empty, as if something was missing. I seemed to have forgotten something very important. Captain Smith dropped us off at my parents' house in an old-fashioned neighborhood. Upon opening the door, dust filled the air. Such a big dust cloud, cough, cough. I absentmindedly walked towards the wall in the living room, staring at the large family photo. Something inside me was struggling, as I saw myself in uniform, embracing my parents, the three of us smiling happily, a complete picture. But I felt like I had missed something. Nina and I cleaned up the house together, and when I saw the old mountain bike on the balcony, a scene popped into my mind, under a clear blue sky, a boy was riding, with a sleeping girl on the back seat, so tender it made one's heart ache. The scene only existed for a moment. We also found many childhood photos, Nina cherished them, but I felt nothing. When we were almost done cleaning, Nina asked me to go to the supermarket to buy some daily necessities. I had no idea where the supermarket was, but once I went downstairs, I turned right instinctively, raising my right hand as if I should be holding onto something. As if completely expected, I saw a small supermarket at the end of the alley. The shopkeeper at the supermarket looked surprised to see me, then very familiarly said, Thomas, you've finally returned. You have no idea how long Monica has been waiting for you. She still says, after I left, I always see Monica sitting alone at the door of her small supermarket. Every time she comes over to ask why I didn't come with her, she just smiles and says next time. But every time, it's just her alone. Sometimes, as she speaks, the little girl's eyes turn red. She said she had never seen such a pitiful girl, asking me not to argue with her anymore, asking us to live well together. The supermarket lady kept talking, but I didn't know how to respond. Images of Monica keep popping up in my mind, her holding my hand and talking non-stop about the future, what kind of life we should have. I see her looking at me, her eyes full of love. But I already have Nina, and Monica has started a new life. Even if we had something before, it should be. In the past. Almost like running away, I quickly left the supermarket after buying some daily necessities. I don't know why, but the thought of Monica completely disappearing from my world makes my chest ache, so much pain. I lit a cigarette, standing on the street looking at this familiar yet strange city, feeling indescribable emotions, just wanting to leave quickly and return to the island. As one cigarette ends, the bus number 25 stops in front of me, the door opens, and I inexplicably board the bus. The bus is full of students just out of school, all with student heads, blue and white school uniforms. The person from the blurry memories is also wearing such clothes, sitting by the window. It's as if I see the 18-year-old Monica waving at me, asking me to sit next to her to tell her stories. This bus has a total of 13 stops, but I got off when the bus stopped at Shanyang intersection. After getting off, I entered a new residential area called Chang'an Kongcheng, strangely familiar. Just as I was about to go in, Nina called. I hailed a taxi and headed home. The residential area in the rearview mirror kept getting farther away, but I didn't feel closer to home, instead feeling more distant. Nina and I have been here for three days, meeting old friends and colleagues. Looking at their unfamiliar faces and overflowing enthusiasm, I only feel guilty. They pat my shoulder, slowly getting choked up, just live, just. Live. They were clearly happy I had returned, but for some reason, when they looked at me, there seemed to be a hint of hesitation, as if I should ask them something, as if the current me shouldn't be like this. On the third day, Denise found me. She said I still had a house. Suddenly, a place came to my mind, and when she took us to Chang and Kongcheng, it resonated with my heart. Three units, third floor, two households. When Nina asked, which one? 
I was already standing in front of 302 on the left. Denise, who was about to open the door, looked at me and suddenly froze, yes, it's 302. It was 8 or 9 in the morning, the best time for sunlight. Opening the door, sunlight flooded the floor, a layout of three bedrooms and two living rooms, each room bathed in sunshine. So much sunlight, Tom, did you buy this house for the sunlight? I don't know, but there seems to be a more perfect answer in my memory. The room is mostly orange, with orange curtains, orange sofa covers, and orange bedsheets, giving a warm feeling. There are many marks on the walls, like frames left behind. In the living room, there's a large bar counter, strangely with no alcohol, just various kinds of flower tea, over a dozen. Nina laughed, finally understand why you like flower tea. Tom, there's a gift for you. As she spoke, an orange cat ran out of the bedroom, completely yellow except for its neck, which was white. Strangely, the cat came straight to me, circling my legs, rubbing against them eagerly, meowing urgently. I finally bent down, as if she had been waiting for a long time, she jumped onto my arm and snuggled into my arms. Oh! Such a friendly cat! Let me hug you! Nina reached out to hug it, but was rewarded with two slaps. This was originally Tom's cat, her name is Potato, you adopted her in the first place, these days I've been helping to take care of her, and it's been exhausting me. No wonder she was so friendly to me. I carried her into the room we were just in, took out a can of cat food from the bedside cabinet, the little one seemed hungry and pounced on it before I even opened the lid. Denise laughed and said, it has to be you, she won't eat if others feed her. Alright, I have to leave for something, just contact me if you need anything. After seeing off Denise, I heard a scream from behind, Nina was scratched by the cat, I quickly took out the first aid kit from under the TV cabinet and found iodine to disinfect Nina. Tom, how did you know there was iodine there? I. I don't know, it just felt instinctual. Nina smiled at the cat eating the canned food, looks like this cat doesn't like me very much. We were supposed to stay for two more days, but suddenly there was an issue at the restaurant, Nina rushed back to deal with it. She asked me to stay for two more days to finish meeting the people I needed to see. These days, I met many people, but I always felt like I hadn't met the most important one. Somehow that evening, I started running a high fever, I was dazed and confused, stuck in a dream unable to wake up. I dreamt of a child being born in this house, going to the local elementary school, then the middle school in the area, and excelling in the best high school. He rode his bike to school early every day, always leaving room for one more on the back seat his backpack always had two thermos cups. Slowly, he went to college, joined the police academy, and everyone was happy for him. At the Thanksgiving dinner, he hugged a girl and boasted. One day we will reunite, and it will be for our wedding. The girl blushed, but he took it as a promise. The girl was gentle, very kind to him, she personally got a red string for him to wear, hoping to keep him safe. He also got one for her hoping she wouldn't make fun of the mole at the corner of his eye. Year after year, he planned his proposal early on, he was a bit of a mess, so was his proposal, what was supposed to be a beautiful proposal turned into a scene of a car accident. The car crashed into his proposal setup, the girl cried, he thought she was moved to tears by his proposal, after all, the entire scene was decorated with flowers she liked, an orange background, all their friends and family. He gently picked up the girl and said, it's time. He knew the girl would marry him, so he dared to plan such a proposal. Later, everything went as planned, they took wedding photos, packed wedding candies, booked a hotel, tasted the food four times, this was the only wedding in his life, he couldn't afford to be careless. Everything was prepared, on the night of the rehearsal, even though he knew it was just a rehearsal, he was so nervous that he made a wrong turn. Finally, when it was over, he received an order, the girl told him to go ahead, he promised to come back to marry her in a week but the mission was very difficult, they were ambushed, severely injured. He was thrown into the sea, seawater rushed into his stomach, his organs were being squeezed, his face was turning red, his lungs were about to burst, bang. I woke up sweating profusely, breathing heavily, the feeling of oppression and suffocation slowly receded from me. I saw the photo album open on the table, the person in my dream and the young man in the photo slowly overlapped. In the middle of the night, I rushed out of the house, I went back to Chang'an Kong City again, as I opened the door, I heard someone say. The sunlight is warm on the body, Potato also loves it. 
Tom Tom, how about we live here from now on? With Tom and Potato, let's have another daughter in the future, Tom, our family of four will definitely be very happy. Okay, then we'll buy this place. So, this was the reason. Don't drink cola, your throat easily gets inflamed, I'll make you a cup of herbal tea, do you want rose or lily? I refuse, I want chrysanthemum. Looking at the dozen types of herbal tea, I suddenly realized, it's not that I love drinking herbal tea. Every piece of furniture in our house was personally chosen by the two of us. On the natural wood-colored bed, I was afraid she wouldn't wake up and would refuse to marry me, so I scheduled the wedding for the evening. However, the one absent from the wedding was me. The brown sofa, where I once spent two nights sleeping because of saying the wrong words, writing a thousand-word self-critique, and incidentally crafting my proposal vows. Looking at the nails on the wall, I walked to the bedroom, knelt by the bed, and reached out to find a large box. All the hidden photos were here. From the first photo of us as teenagers to our wedding photo, she stood in an orange wedding dress under the setting sun, smiling as beautifully as the little blue orchid in her arms. When I proposed, she didn't hesitate and agreed without a second thought. She believed in me so much at that time, believing I could give her all my love. There was also a doll in the box, the one she caught on the day of the proposal. She said it was her lucky charm, just an ordinary doll, but because that day was the day of my proposal, she gave it new meaning out of love for me. Finally, I found two thermos cups, one blue and one pink. Back then, I couldn't bear for her to take more than a sip at a time from her cup, I cherished her so much at that time. Those were all Thomas's treasures. I am Thomas. How could I forget myself? How could I forget that I am Thomas? I completely broke down, tears uncontrollably streaming down. Monica. So, I had met you long ago, why didn't I recognize you? Why? Ah. I hammered the ground as if possessed, blood flowing to release the anger in my heart. After venting, I collapsed on the ground like a deflated balloon. I looked at my Monica with blurry eyes as she got up from bed near dusk, boasting about making fish stew for me and the potatoes. Slowly reaching out my hand, wanting to embrace her once more. You go rest, there will be fish soup for you when you wake up. I couldn't help but move closer and closer. Potato, come down, don't bother dad, mom will open a can for you, be good, dad just came back so exhausted. She turned away, holding Potato. Don't go, don't leave me. I suddenly lunged forward, falling to the floor again, the pain bringing me back to reality. This is Thomas's life. A life with Monica is Thomas's life. I disappeared for three days, Captain Smith and Denise found me in Chang and Kanchung. When they found me, I was lying on the ground holding our wedding photo, lifeless. Where's Monica? Please, tell me where Monica is? Please. Denise and Captain Smith exchanged a glance, and in their eyes, I saw regret. The girl on the tombstone looked exactly like the one in my memory. I knelt in front of her, trembling as I reached out to touch her face. Monica, I'm back, Monica, I'm back. No one ever jumped on me to hug me again, and no one waited for me to come home. What have I done? What have I done? Thomas, Monica left you a letter. Urgently, I opened that letter and saw the familiar handwriting. Thomas. When we were young, you often wrote to me, but I rarely wrote back to you. I never thought that the one letter I did write would become my last. Don't feel guilty. I understand everything. Surviving was already not easy for you. As for the rest, follow your heart. For me, my Thomas will always be loving me until death, and that's enough. We loved each other at the best age, and every year you loved me firmly was incredibly happy. Although we missed having a wedding, in my heart, I've married you a thousand times already. We are family for life. I am truly content in this lifetime. In the future, you will live as Tom, do not blame the heavens and the earth. Ultimately, it is our fate that we are not meant to be together. Don't think of me anymore, let me be at peace in my next life. My Thomas, I hope you find peace, I hope you live this life in peace. Best regards. Monica. After reading the letter, I felt like my insides were being torn apart. 
I slumped to the ground, the letter in my arms soaked with tears. I left the graveyard in a daze. Turns out, being alive is worse than death. Nina's Side Story When I received the call from the police, I had just finished dealing with a leak in the kitchen. I thought it was Tom calling me to pick him up, but the police said he was critically injured and unconscious. I went back to Lynn City for the second time, Captain Smith greeted me. On the way, he told me that Tom had regained his memory, remembered his name, and his fiance. However, his fiance had passed away due to illness, leaving him in deep pain. Tears welled up in my eyes, so, does he want to be with her? Captain Smith shook his head. Monica won't allow him to do that, and he promised to live in front of Monica. It was an accident this time. He was hit by a car while trying to save a little girl. I wiped away my tears, unable to speak. How is he doing? Captain Smith remained silent, looking out the window. It was only after the doctor arrived that I understood why Captain Smith had that expression. The doctor said, the patient has absolutely no will to live. Talk to him more, maybe it will help. Seeing Tom in the hospital bed, I felt lost, I could only call his name. Tom, our restaurant was just starting to thrive, we just got married, please wake up, okay? The person in the hospital bed still showed no reaction. He was determined to leave, and we couldn't stop him. Tom, I'm sorry, I changed your life, I was too selfish, it's all my fault, damn it, please stay alive. No matter what I said, the person in the bed showed no response. Seeing him like this, I remembered the first time I saw him. He was rescued from the sea by his father's fishing boat, covered in injuries. His father, kind-hearted, felt it was fate and borrowed a lot of money to treat him. This added to our family's debts, and the repayment deadline was the end of the month. However, they came early that day, took everything valuable from our home, demolished our small rundown restaurant, and even broke my father's legs. After he recovered, overwhelmed with guilt, he made up his mind to repay our debts. We worked together for two years, clearing all debts. Just as he was about to leave, my father fell ill, entrusted me and the small restaurant to him in critical condition. He knew my father's wish and silently expanded our old rundown restaurant. I knew he was secretly searching for his family, we even reported the case together. However, the town on the island was backwards, and we couldn't find any information about him. I also knew he wanted to leave the island to find his family, but I in the small restaurant held him back. After agreeing to marry me, he never searched for his family again. He promised me that he would fulfill my father's wish, take care of me well, and I finally felt at ease. I was so afraid of losing him, and as time passed, things got better between us. The appearance of Captain Smith and the others made me alert again, especially when Monica appeared. It was almost intuitive. The moment Monica saw Thomas, I knew they might have had a past. But so what? I am the one standing by Thomas now, and I am the one about to marry Thomas. Moreover, in these five years, I have come to understand Tom to some extent. He is the best person I have ever met, he values his promises the most. Since he agreed to be with me, he will not go back on his word. But maybe it was guilt, perhaps I had a vague sense that the person Tom had been searching for all these years might be Monica. I began to deliberately get closer to her, intentionally revealing to her the past five years with Tom. I told her how good Tom had been to me in these five years, how much he loved me, constantly reassuring her that Tom and I would be happy together. Tom loved me now, and I believed that no one in this world loved Thomas more than I did. Even without that accident, I had actually vaguely guessed that she was the person Tom had been looking for all along. Yet Tom hadn't recognized her, and she had surprisingly not been honest. I thought she had given in to me, and while feeling guilty, I was more grateful. Grateful that I had held onto my own happiness. But I never expected that she would fall ill. She wasn't giving in to me, she just didn't want to make things difficult for Tom. She was thinking of him until the very end. I looked at the person on the hospital bed and revealed the most tormenting truth, actually, you're right to blame me. After we reported the case years ago, there was news that came in, but I stopped it all because I couldn't bear to leave you. I truly wanted to be with you all along. I wiped away the tears at the corners of my eyes. 
Now I realize my mistake. It was my fault that you and Monica were kept apart. Without my interference, maybe you would have been together long ago, Monica wouldn't have fallen ill. Every mistake is my fault. If you want to leave, then go. I won't force you to stay anymore. As soon as I finished speaking, the person on the hospital bed's fingers moved slightly. Just as I thought he was about to wake up, suddenly the alarms in the hospital room went off, then a flatline appeared on the monitoring equipment. Tom. Tom had left. I buried him and Monica together. They were meant to be together, all because of me, they missed out on five years in vain, not recognizing each other when they finally met. I am a sinner, and the only way I can atone is to let them reunite. As for me, I will spend the rest of my life with the island, praying for them day and night. Farewell, my Tom.